Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gushkowitz remains a Russian prisoner after losing his appeal against the extension of his detention earlier this week. He will remain in prison ahead of his trial for espionage. The White House has repeatedly condemned the Kremlin for this, calling it repression of the freedom of the press. State Department spokesman Vedant Patel echoed those sentiments in Wednesday's press conference, saying, We, we continue to feel that the, this whole uh, legal process as it relates to Evan uh, is a sham. Uh, we've been very clear that Evan is wrongfully detained. Gershkovitz is being held at the notorious Lefortova prison in Moscow, where he now faces up to 20 years in jail. In his court appearance for the decision, Evan stood in a glass cage wearing a dark T-shirt and jeans, smiling briefly to the media before they were ordered out of the court. Evan's parents also attended the hearing, as did the U.S. ambassador to Russia, Lynn Tracy, who spoke about Evan's strength. Evan continued to show remarkable strength and resiliency in these very difficult circumstances. But Evan is not the only American who remains a Russian prisoner. Former Marine Paul Whelan is still being held in Russia under espionage charges and has been in a prison camp for the last four years. During that time, basketball player Brittany Griner and another former Marine, Trevor Reed, were released as part of prisoner swaps. But there has been no apparent progress on a swap for Gershkovitz or Whelan, with many asking, what more can the administration do? It's devastating. It's very tragic, and it, yeah, I feel very sad. Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman Michael McCall, is hard at work fighting for Evans' freedom. For the family, and especially his mother, um, I can't imagine what she's going through. And, of course, you know, colleagues at Wall Street Journal, to see their colleagues in a glass cage, obviously not being treated very well. Probably has no access to a doctor, you know, for the crime he didn't commit. And it's just outrageous. And this is how Putin operates. And sadly, probably not the end of this. We're going to see more of this taking prisoners for ransom purposes. You know, and uh, how can we possibly get him out? In the Griner case, it was very unbalanced in terms of the trade. I mean, we were supposed to get Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner out. They only released Brittany Griner, who essentially had like a vape pipe in exchange for an arms dealer that we exchanged. Who do you think is partly to blame for that? decision. Should the administration have stuck and said, no, it is Paul Whelan that we want to, to exchange first? He's been there for four years. He should be a priority. Yeah. I mean, uh, Paul Whelan was a Marine. I think it was calculated on Putin's part to uh, release the celebrity basketball star. And we're glad that she's home and then uh, still detain the, uh, the Marine uh, symbolically as a slap in the face. I don't think it was a fair trade. And it's tricky, right, because you, you want to get them out, but you don't want to encourage, you know, further people being in prison for no reason and to be held hostage as political pawns. And that's, that's what we're seeing more and more out of Putin and Russia. Yeah. Um, when Russia takes an American, shouldn't they be afraid? Shouldn't there be real sanctions? And how can we set that? How can we make countries more afraid to take Americans? Well, projecting strength, not weakness, uh, letting them know that there will be very harsh consequences if they do this, and letting them know we're not going to we're going to trade, um, you know, prisoners if, if that's what has to be done. That the charges should be more equal and not so disparate as we saw in the Brittany Griner trade for the arms dealer, and I would argue led to the imprisonment of, you know, of Evan that we're seeing today. And in Evan's case. This is probably the worst that I've seen because he was simply reporting the news. And, of course, that frightens Putin. The truth, you know, in a dictatorship, they fear the truth more than anything, and it gets out to his own people. And he fears his own people, and so that's precisely why I think he detained and now imprisoned uh, Evan. And uh, I'm personally working through a lot of different channels to get him out of there. Um, these are very tricky cases. They're very hard because you're really at the mercy of Putin. And I think because we have rewarded him in the past, he's going to expect that same reward in the future. Other than a prisoner swap, what other methods might be used? What, what other avenues could we take? I mean, sanctions won't work because the Russia is so heavily sanctioned because of the Ukraine invasion. So other than a prisoner swap, what are the other possibilities? Well, we could do secondary sanctions, which we should have done anyway. I mean, the, the sanctions in place are working okay, but not really like 
secondary sanctions would. And I think we should send a stronger statement to them. This is unacceptable. But, you know, I think this administration has projected weakness all along, and it just emboldens Putin and encourages this bad behavior. What would your message be to any Americans living or working in Russia at the moment or any American who is thinking about traveling there? I'd be very careful. You could be the victim of one of these political pawn, you know, imprisonment cases. And uh, to any reporter, certainly in Russia, that uh, what happened to Evan can happen to you, that you could be charged with espionage just for reporting the truth about what is happening uh, in Russia and in Ukraine. Um, so they, they're in a very uh, precarious, dangerous situation. I've traveled to Russia, you know, myself, and I was under very heavy surveillance. And if you can be compromised, they're going to try to compromise you. And if they can get something out of you in a prisoner swap, they may likely detain and imprison you. You know, Paul Whalen's been over there for years now. He was supposed to be part of this last deal. And at the last minute, Putin um, broke his promise on that. What, what is your message to Evan right now? If Evan were able to hear you today, what would you say to him? That we're with you that we're working every channel possible to get you out and that we're praying for you. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to put, and I and the Congress will continue to put pressure on Putin and Russia. We passed a strong resolution condemning his wrongful detainment of Evan and imprisonment. And um, we're just not going to tolerate this, holding U.S. citizens hostage under false pretenses. And that if they do continue this and if they don't free Evan, that in the Congress, even if this administration won't do it, will pursue secondary sanctions on Putin and Russia. As the fight for Evan's release remains a priority on Capitol Hill, another years-long fight for an American's freedom continues. Former Marine Paul Whelan's family has been demanding the release of their loved one for four years, and they have no plans of stopping until Paul is back home. I think that uh, it's hard for people to understand how something like this changes the people who are involved in it, not just the person who is uh, incarcerated, but uh, the family as well. We speak with Paul's brother, David Whalen. I can't even imagine what it's been like for Paul and who he is now, uh, and not being able to talk to him and really understand in detail uh, what his experience has been like, um, the fear that he may have experienced, the uncertainty about his future, uh, the anxiety that he must go through every single day. And so uh, I, I think that that's, uh, that's a challenge that everybody in our family has faced, but I can't even imagine what it's been like for Paul. Yeah. How much do we know about his current conditions? Where is he being held? And, and what is what is life, what is daily life like for him? For the first 18 months, he was held at Lafortova pretrial detention in Moscow, and then he was moved in June of 2020, I guess it was to uh, IK-17, which is a, a labor camp in Mordovia, which is a, a republic in the Federation. And he's been there for the last three years, almost exactly three years. And uh, he seems to be doing fine. I mean, his he's been taking care of his health, that we've been sending him what we can as far as over-the-counter medicines, uh, food to supplement the food that they get in prison, which isn't very much. He's allowed four packages a year. So the US Embassy and the other embassies have been really good at taking those packages for us. Uh, because we don't have Russian bank accounts. We don't have the ability to get him resources inside the country. So it's difficult, but he's doing the best he can. I think he's done a remarkable job of surviving uh, day to day. How, how often are your parents able to speak to him? I believe they've had some phone calls with him, but how often is there a contact between you, him and the family? Uh, it's usually on a daily basis. It was on a daily basis up until two or three weeks ago. Um, he was able to make 15 minute calls to our parents. Uh, and then uh, there was a uh, RT news uh, crew came out to the prison and Paul refused to speak to them. And ever since then, the uh, prison guards have been disrupting the phone calls, his ability to call the embassy or to call home. And uh, it's that sort of retaliation, that uncertainty that uh, you never really know um, what's going on day to day. Yeah. Um, going back to when Paul was arrested, what, what were the Russian accusations against him and sort of, uh, how, how wrong are they? I think they couldn't be more wrong. They accused him of uh, espionage. And uh, they said that a USB drive given to him by a friend had some sort of state secret on it. Uh, no one has ever seen it. Uh, the lawyers, uh, I'm not sure, have seen it either. But uh, we certainly don't have any idea what that was. And, and Paul never saw it either because he uh, was given the USB drive and then was immediately arrested by state security services. Hmm. 
how do you feel, of course, seeing Brittany Griner, Trevor Reed be swapped when Paul has not yet been released? When you're dealing with Russia, you realize that they are willing to do things that Western countries aren't willing to do, in part because I don't think they care about the individual person. Um, I was thrilled when Brittany Griner came home and I was thrilled when Trevor Reed came home but because I think if, if you start to focus only on Paul and, you know, why isn't Paul coming home? Uh, I think you start to lose your humanity and become a lot like the Kremlin is. Um, and so, uh, you know, I would obviously love to have my brother home, but I don't begrudge these other Americans uh, their freedom at all. Um, how has Paul felt? Uh, have you spoken to him specifically about, obviously, you know, Trevor coming back to the U.S. and Brittany coming back to the U.S.? How does that make Paul feel? I think he's just like we are. Uh, he's very disappointed that he has not come home. But I think he understands that uh, it's important to get Americans home when you have the opportunity to do so. And so the administration has done a good job of getting Americans home. And we hope that eventually Paul will be one of those Americans that gets to come home. Yeah. Uh, you said before that you really want to keep pressure on the White House at the moment. You really want to keep this pressure building uh, so that people you know, are constantly thinking about Paul. And How can you do that? What, what do you need to keep doing? What is the, the message from, from you and the family? Our message is really focused on the White House and we uh, and, and working with people in the State Department or the uh, National Security Council uh, to stay on top of what, what are they doing? You know, uh, have they tried something? And, and, and if they have tried, what is the result of it? And to suggest maybe not to wait too long before they try something else. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to is the Kremlin going to take a concession and what concession is the U.S. government willing to make? That's really those are the only uh, actions that can uh, bring Paul home. What would you like all our listeners to know? In what way can they help this course to keep the voice going? Really, the best thing you can do for any prisoner, whether it's Paul or Evan Gershkovich or any any uh, one who is detained in this sort of situation, is to remind them about their humanity. I think one of the things we heard when Brittany Griner came home was how much she appreciated getting letters and mail from people. Uh, and and Ms. Griner was very gracious at encouraging people to write to Paul. And so I would say the same thing. Go to freepaulwhelan.com and find the address that's on that website. It's, a, it's an American address, it's at the State Department, uh, and send Paul a letter. That's really the best thing you could do. Don't send any packages because he only gets four a year. Um, and we do use that for food and mail, but uh, send Paul a letter or a postcard and just let him know that you remember him and that you're, you're thinking about him. Perfect. Uh, look, I'm so grateful for your time today and um, I hope we get to meet in person one day as well with Paul too. Sounds great, Ben. I appreciate your time. Thanks.